I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guest today is Dr. Michael Olachlin, professor in the College of Education and Health Sciences and professor in the PhD program in clinical psychology at Adelphi University, New York. He has authored, co-authored, or edited 10 books and numerous journal articles. Since 2018, he has been co-editor of the journal Psychoanalysis, Culture, and Society. He is also the editor of the book series Psychoanalytic Interventions, Clinical, Social, and Cultural Contexts, and co-editor of the book series Critical Childhood and Youth Studies, Theoretical Explorations and Practices in Clinical, Educational, Social, and Cultural Contexts, both from Lexington Books. He is in private practice on Long Island, New York. For more, please visit his website, michaelolachlanphd.com. If you're listening to this episode on the Rendering Unconscious podcast stream, please know there is also a video of this discussion on YouTube. Just find Rendering Unconscious podcast at YouTube at Trapart Films YouTube channel. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry from Chapart Books, 2019. For more, please visit our publisher's website, trapart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash v-a-n-e-s-s-a two. 3. C-A-R-L. Your support is greatly appreciated. For more information, you can also visit my website, drvanessasinclair.net, or the podcast main website, renderingunconscious.org. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. Well, what I, what I wanted to begin with is, is saying that whenever I get a book, I always spend a lot of time reading the blurbs, the acknowledgments, and the introduction, because I always like to see the situatedness of people's knowledge and where things come from. Knowledge of ideas is really important. And I think one of the contributions of what you're doing is you're creating an archive of genealogy of knowledge. In fact, if you saw the syllabuses for my classes in all of my syllabi, I have wherever possible links to authors so that people can actually experience them in audio or or video, because I think it really helps to contextualize people's lives in ways that you don't get just by reading, let's say, journal articles or even books. But I thought I'd begin, actually, by my first reaction when you asked me to do this was to write to you and say, well, do you have some direction? You said, no, 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 you should just begin where you want to, and nothing to say. And I was talking to my wife, Margaret, last week, and she said, if somebody asked me to sit down with no agenda, I would have nothing to say either. And I was really struck by that reaction. And then I looked at uh, the Bob Samuels interview and the Sheldon George interview, two of my friends and colleagues, and I thought, well, maybe I can find something to say. And that brought me to thinking I should start autobiographically. And it brought me back 60 years to when I was in second grade. And my teacher for the first three years, which we called in Ireland junior infants, senior infants in first grade, uh, beat us regularly, and she was verbally abusive. The teacher for the fifth and sixth grade was equally sadistic. He beat us all the time with a stick. And in between, we had this one teacher for, four, for third, second, third, and fourth grade. who was a very lovely lady who had just obviously come out of college and was about to get married who didn't teach us at all. She spent all the time working at her desk making crafts. And we sat there and occasionally she would rap the desk with her meter stick to try and make us be a little bit quiet. 
but we did no learning. But she was, uh, she was due for an evaluation because she was on probation and the inspector was coming in. She didn't tell us that she was being inspected. She told us we were being inspected and she threatened us with great amounts of threat to perform for the inspector. In Ireland in those days was they examined the children. So he asked us lots of questions and we were really quite terrified. And I'm sitting in my desk, I'm sitting, and he called me to the front of the room. And in my understanding of uh, people in authority, that could only mean trouble. And he spoke to me and he asked me my name. And he said, when you grow up, what would you like to do? And I said, I have no idea. Or some words to that effect. He said, you should go to university if possible. And I took that idea from this man when I was seven years old and I kept it inside my head and told nobody. I was afraid to even think about the thought because uh, the idea that you could have an interior life and you could imagine your structure of knowledge was really beyond my imagination. So flash forward a few years, I'm in high school. In high school, I lived in the west of Ireland and I was homeless. So we all brought in five pounds to pay for a trip to the university for a tour. All the people in the upper class, because the, the rest of them weren't going anywhere, but we, I believe we were. And we toured the university, we saw the science labs, and we met some professors and did all that. And when we came back, the guidance counselor, who was a priest, because all the schools in Ireland were run by, he said, you should come and speak to me, to everybody, about your plans. So I went into his office one day, and he says, you know, why are you wasting my time? you're not going anywhere. Your family doesn't have money. Your father's a laborer, you know. Don't, don't waste my time. And he just yelled at me and I left. So the, the was, was knowing without authorship, no, knowing without being able to claim a space for yourself. And then I went on and the only way I could get education at third level university was to go into teacher training. So I got a two year teaching diploma, which uh, was good. And then the government wanted to upskill the teachers, so they ordered the university to offer bachelor's degrees for us. So I went to university, which I loved doing and did very well. And uh, one night I had a professor who was extremely uh, lazy young woman. And being the kind of uh, obnoxious young man I was, I said, you know, what the hell are we doing here? And she admitted that the department chair had told us we were coming in at night. We wanted nothing but a credential and to teach us as little as possible. So I left school uh, really very, very angry at the, at the lack of invitation to enter the learning process. We weren't expected to do more. And when I was seeking to do further graduate study, you couldn't get in an hour and be a night student and not a day student, and therefore inferior. So I came to New York and I went to Columbia. And my ability to conceptualize my knowing was really limited by my background, so I chose to go into school psychology, which turned out to be a very narrow discipline in behaviorism, how to test children and how to control their behavior. I was enormously disappointed, but as it happens, the program was also quite unethical and I blew the whistle on the program and kicked up a big stink. So then I thought I need to switch disciplines and I moved into developmental psychology. I didn't know developmental psychology was focused entirely on children who were white, middle-class, universal, non-contextualized, and all the same in some respects. And so I did my doctoral work in developmental psychology and left uh, with absolutely no sense of my capacity to own my learning, think my thoughts, and have an interior life that felt satisfying to me. I taught in two universities, the first one for a couple of years in Ohio, then I moved back to Long Island to it, not the university I'm in now, but to another one called Hofstra. And I got so tired of teaching the psychology I'd been taught that I started teaching social justice courses for teachers around race, class, and, and gender issues. And did that tolerably well. And then I moved into being director of a doctoral program there where I found a professor who had been sexually exploiting students. This professor was way more connected to the establishment than I was. They couldn't fire me because I was uh, tenured, but they punished me in a million and forced me to leave. And that's when I ended up at Adolphi, where I'm now employed. In talking to a professor there, Joe Newworth, who was the head of their psychomanalytic training program. 
I didn't actually think I had any interest in psychoanalysis. I needed a credential to, to run a private practice. So Joe invited me in and we had a conversation. And that conversation changed the entire notion of my life because suddenly I began to of experiencing your own experience, understanding your own knowing and claiming your own space became really Maybe I'm skipping a little bit. I began to write in the beginning. I began to write academic stuff that was completely disembodied from my experience. And then before I even went to psychoanalysis, I started reading some feminist writers and beginning to feel like, as Carolyn Halbrun, I think, claim a space. This was when the women's movement was sort of big into these ideas of ownership. So when I got to psychoanalysis, I guess I was well prepared in a sense for the idea that I could come to know, so so I can. It was um, it was halfway through my life career almost, really, for me. And so I, once I entered psychoanalysis, I became quite a convert very quickly because I found in it, and the academic courses again were were very disappointing in many respects, but the focused on helping me to name my own experience and find my own way, and that was the first time in all of my education, except maybe that man I met in second grade where somebody had expressed to me the possibility that you could experience uh, learning in ways that were emancipatory. Uh, now, I'm very interested in social justice. That didn't enter the picture until I did my own reading because what I thought to do is to talk about two papers that express my current work. One is on cultural ruptures and one is on whiteness. And the way I thought to do that was to share two autobiographic stories and then show how using psychoanalysis, the ways that I try to use it. So if you're, is that okay with you if I share a little bit of reading that will give you an autobiographical context for each yeah. story? Okay. wonderful. So the first story is actually, I, I need a nine called The Subject of Childhood, which is primarily autobiographical. Now, if I read that material now, obviously, I think the difference is that you can keep obviously revisiting your life and doing new working through. Sometimes I have patients who say, I don't want to go to another analyst because if I do, I'll have to tell my story all over again. And I go, well, that's actually the point, <laughs> that it's in the retelling that possibilities emerge. So while I'm reading some of the material that has the original story, I think the experience of that experience is, leads to new insights for me. So the first one I called it, um, this comes from my paper, the title of which is, Cultural Ruptures and Their Consequences for Mental Health Across Generations, which is an essay I just completed for a book that uh, Ingo Lambrecht from, from Auckland and Anna Levis from the from United Kingdom are editing for the ISPS book series for Routledge, which will be out probably next year if we're lucky. And this section goes like this. My father grew up on a subsistence farm consisting of 20 acres of barren bog land. He tried to scrape together a living there for himself and his new wife, my mother, that my father could only purchase his weekly pack of cigarettes from a traveling vendor if he had sufficient eggs to barter. All of his siblings had migrated to London and he remained at home as the designated caretaker to his aging parents. His father was an alcoholic and by all accounts, his mother suffered severe paranoid psychosis. She was so violent that my father had to relocate out of fear that she would murder my mother. At least two of my father's siblings suffered from alcoholism and both died in very poor circumstances in London. My father suffered significant anxiety throughout his life, including severe panic attacks. My mother too grew up destitute. She lost her mother early and the family was so poor they had only one presentable frock to wear between the two of them. There wouldn't be any point in me talking to you, she said when I sought to interview her because I couldn't tell you the bad things. They are too awful. I wouldn't want anyone to know them. She was not persuaded by my and understanding how I came to be. Her argument appeared to be partly composed of a suggestion that such painful memories are best forgotten and partly that revelation of abject memories could only perpetuate shame. She spoke rep repeatedly prefacing her remarks with, you won't believe this, or I can't believe we had it that hard. When her mother was dying of tuberculosis, was about seven, she and her siblings were never told of their mother's impending death. Rooting through a chest of clothing at home one day, the children found what they thought was a brown dress. When they asked her father about it, he told them to ask their grandmother. 
she harshly told them it was the habit in which their mother was to be buried. When their mother finally died, the children weren't even informed. When I asked if any process was put in place to assist the children in mourning, my mother looked at me in amazement for making such a naive inquiry. It was awful hard. I can't think of anything like it. Every time we heard that someone died, I felt like I was going to vomit. It had an awful effect on us. Don't talk of it. The regimen of domestic servitude and deprivation only intensified thereafter. In seeking to receive and understand my mother's childhood losses, I concluded that piece of writing as follows. In my mother's family, we have three generations of a family of rural Irish people, victims of severe deprivation and suffering in the present, bearers of untold trauma from a genocidal family to my mother and her siblings who had suffered such catastrophic losses. There was a certain hardness in the Ireland of my youth and earlier when it came to children's emotions. They were attempting to wrap my mind around her and describe the indescribable nature of her unwarranted losses was an unforgettable experience for me. Part of my heaviness of heart undoubtedly came from my empathy with my mother's legacy of suffering and part no doubt came from the indubitable realization that my subjectivity was formed in the crucible of my mother's losses. I also marvel that despite her upbringing and contrary to my father's more incommunicable and heavy-handed approach, my mother managed to transcend her pain and raise her children with fortitude, love, and empathy. I don't have precise genealogical food that their parents were born around 1890, their grandparents around 1860, and their great-grandparents around 1830, during a period of significant famine, but before the massive failure of the potato crop that occurred in 1845 to 1850. My parents' great-grandparents then, as well as all of the poorer classes of Irish people, or the sundry diseases that accompany this catastrophe, necessarily were mutant witnesses to this unfolding tragedy, as well as participants in the calamity. Their children, my parents' grandparents, were born into this calamitous suffering, and my parents, born in the 1920s, were only a short remove from the catastrophe and suffered severe deprivation due to poverty, lack of educational opportunity, and the melancholy circumstances of their upbringing. These experiences could be unique to my family, but conversations with colleagues who provide therapeutic services to the poorest members of the London Irish community suggest otherwise, as do the contributions in Tom Hayden's anthology, Irish Hunger. For instance, uh, David Lloyd said, the silence is at once the silence of depopulation and the sounds of a traumatized culture. The wail is the almost animal wail of despair and passivity before a catastrophe that seems to exceed comprehension. In my inquiry into that, it really brings together my interest in psychoanalysis, trauma, history, and memory. In that paper, I began with the discussion of Irish folklore. Uh, I, I recount the work of two leading Irish folklorists, Gerardo Crowley, who's quite famous folklorist and a poet, Nuala Nigona. Okruliak looks at the history of Irish folklore and he talks about a large between the 16 and 1800s. Ireland had a genocidal war in 1650 when Oliver Cromwell came to Ireland. It was very reminiscent of the Trail of Tears in the United States where all the native indigenous Irish were driven to the west of Ireland, to the poorest, most barren land. And hundreds of thousands were killed slaughtered, in fact, in massive amounts of killings. I, I don't know the exact number, I think 40, 50% of the population was eliminated. And between 1650 and 1850, when the great hunger struck, the Irish language disappeared. Disappeared, largely because the British had a policy of mandating uh, that the all the services, including schooling, be provided in English and providing severe punishment for instruction through Gaelic. So, the, so what happened is that during that period, all of the lineage of our ancestry, spirituality that had accumulated over at least 2,000 years in Ireland was severed from the consciousness of the people. And the poet Nuala Nigona talks in very moving terms. She refuses to write her poetry in English. She only writes in Gaelic. She's been translated by Paul Muldoon and others, but she said she wants to try and find a way to create some links with that past. And in fact, I'm renewing my interest in recovering my own Gaelic, which I did learn in school, but which I haven't used in a number of years, because of a recognition of what Devon and Goodyear would call the severance 
he proposes is what happens to people when a large amount of the genealogical subjectivity is, is severed in such a way that people, in many genocides and in many displacements and in many shifts of population, but when it's also accompanied by the elimination of the language in which the original was encoded, it really becomes quite a traumatic, sort of a, a, an obstruction of signification, if you like, an incapacity to make meaning. So that paper uh, tries to talk about the idea of folklore. Then you fast forward to the famine in 1840. The population was 8 million people, and within 25 years, it was 4 million. One million at least of those had literally died on the sides of the road and were buried, many of them in mass graves. And three million of them boarded ships in desperation for London, New York, and Boston. Many died on the way. There were the way, for instance, in Gros Eagle, Quebec. And, and many came to the United States and Canada and died in, in very poor circumstances almost immediately because of their severe deprivation. The ones who did survive, uh, did make it in at the lowest echelon of society in the US and Canada and really struggled to find their footing. The ones who stayed in Ireland, my ancestors included, actually were living witnesses of that experience. And the question is what happens when that experience becomes the, the core of what future generations inherited? We lost a large, uh, for instance, uh, Ju Judith Atkinson, who's a very interesting indigenous writer in Australia, talks about trauma trails and, her, and what happens when a society becomes lower or less. Her studies, for instance, of Australian indigenous people, whom I have written about at times as well, is a study of lower lessness, the cutting off of an entire population from their own inheritance of ancestral wisdom. Jonathan Lear talks nicely about this as well. The Crow Nation began with a, um, a sense of their own identity. And the men were warriors and the women were supporters of the men and domestic workers. Once the cavalry moved in and the United States Western Cavalry, the men lost their purpose in life. And he says, what happens when a crow is no longer a crow? What happens when that severance is made? And so that's the issue that occupies me in writing that paper is the idea of what happens when cultural ruptures are so profound that they sever the social linkages between present and past and people live and go on being would have some further that the Irish society inherited, unfortunately, a, a very Jansenistic form of Catholicism. Jansenism originated with Cornelius Janssen in Netherlands, and it's an extreme punitive, shame-based notion of Catholicism that was profoundly popular or enforced in Ireland. Even when I was a child, we had what were called missions where where these preachers came around and they almost like fundamentalist type sermons, warning about death and destruction. And my own priest, when I was a child, told my parents, you should especially hit them, hit them when they're bad, but you should especially hit them when they're good because they're surely thinking of being bad. So if you layer this Jansenistic philosophy on top of the cultural ruptures that came with the Irish history, you get a situation like the one I experienced growing up. I just finished reading and writing a review of Peter Mulholland's book, which is a history of the Irish, uh, of Irish Catholicism in the 20th century. It's punitiveness, lack of emotion, cherishing, and lack of any interiority in life. Life was about fitting in and finding your place. Not for everybody, of course. This was particularly true for the working classes. And if you followed Irish history, um, you would find that it's profoundly class-based. And Irish historians, for instance, uh, since the, well, in 1962, um, and The Great Hunger was a catalog written by, actually, by a non-historian, by a woman who really was an independent scholar, more of a journalist. And the Irish historians ostracized this person because she tried to describe the genocidal elements of the Irish famine, that in fact the British were exporting food from Ireland while the famine was occurring. They really ostracized her, and there was a taboo in Irish academic circles until 1994 in writing about or speaking about the Irish famine. Very, very slowly post-colonial theory. I wouldn't say it's, it's found a place in Ireland, but very slowly it began to creep into thinking. And there was a realization that this master narrative of history with which we were all raised, which alighted more than it thought, and which didn't allow us to understand our own experience, flawed and then from then on there's been a bit of a
in the last 30 years, a, in the last 25 years, a bit of a renaissance attempt to try and understand the psychology, psychological sequela of the fan. The Irish historians of the time, the most famous of whom is Roy Foster, call this psychobabble, and they've been ranting and ranting about this ever since, and are enormously resistant to the idea that one could use psychoanalytic evidence as a means of understanding experience. So one of the papers I'm working on right now with a colleague from Ireland, Ray O'Neill, is a paper for psychoanalysis and history on the meaning of psychoanalytic evidence. Can we use psychoanalysis as a way to understand experience, which obviously I wouldn't need to convince you or any of my colleagues of because in the historical disciplines and even some in anthropology who are raised in canonical disciplines that are fundamentally positivistic, it's really hard for them to embrace the possibility that emotion is possible and that people who live through history experienced emotion and something happened to those. And in fact, Peter Mulholland's book, which I reviewed, is flawed in that respect that while he grew up in Ireland, I assume, and is Irish, he never mentioned his own location in any part of his work. And I think locatedness is critical. They're required to locate themselves in the work and to choose topics in which they can comfortably locate themselves because I can't see how you can do psychoanalytically oriented work without understanding or coming to understand your own relation to your experience. So, so in, in trying to understand the Irish culture of silence, I'll give you one brief example. When I was a child, they were digging sand from a lo local quarry and they found famine skeletons. I was about 10 years old. Those famine skeletons were in a mass grave, had no money to, and no time and no capacity, and they had multiple diseases, including typhus, that caused everyone to be infected and fearful of infection. So they were just dumped into mass graves. If they were lucky, many, many just died in place. They found one of these mass graves about 300 yards from my home. We as children were told they were famine skeletons. They were disposed of. They weren't discussed. They weren't given a burial ceremony. They weren't treated in any way as sacred. They were just dumped. And so that that's, speaks profoundly to the Irish, the predominant Irish perspective on Irish experience. I remember my mother saying to me once, why do you want to know about all these things? You have a job, just move on and forget about it. And in fact, when I wrote my book, The Subject of Childhood in 2009, my family stopped talking to me for three years until finally one sister called me up and she had a solution. She said, let's pretend you never wrote the book and we can continue on as before. And I said, fine. So you can see that there's a cultural characteristic in that society that's really very, very, very much in denial about the idea of history or the idea of a psychoanalytic history, what some people would call a psychohistory, which would infuse historical understanding with notions of emotion and feeling and indeed of intergenerational transmission. And um, I wanted to sort of share comes from uh, Stephanie Pandolfo, who has done fabulous work in North Africa. She's a psychoanalytically oriented anthropologist. And she wrote a book recently called Not So So. And she uses this framework for understanding. And one of the cases in her book is the story of a young man called Reda who came in for having a psychotic episode into an emergency room. I, I believe it was Morocco. He's, he's there for evaluation. DSM-oriented quantitative evaluation system they have defies understanding. As we know from Ethan Waters' work, the globalization of the American psyche, Americanized methods of understanding have spread around the world. So while he's sitting there being evaluated by these befuddled psychiatrists who are looking at him from a DSM perspective, his mother sits there and she clearly has a full understanding of how his history acting out is in some sense a collective history and not just his own individual history. But she's only his mother. She doesn't get to speak. She gets to take him home and try and deal with it on her own. So Pandolfo's work, Nuts of the Soul, is very, very helpful in understanding the necessity of context and indeed colonization. She doesn't directly address colonization, but the idea of colonization is a core concept in understanding me and you and indeed all of us in the world. The other idea that comes up is, is comes from Ranjana Khanna's work, which is uh, her work, Dark Continents, is about the way in which psychoanalysis, I'll talk about this in more detail in my, in, in later in my discussion, is fundamentally a, a colonizing discipline, that the inherent constitutedness of our subjectivity from a psychoanalytic perspective is colonizing. 
So when we try to understanding, and she uses a book that I've particularly liked for many years, Abraham and Torok's The Shell and the Kernel, and talks about how people who experience what I just described for Irish people, experience a sort of an obstruction of this capacity for signification. They experience, you know, what Abraham and Torok would say is they incorporate rather than metabolize experience. So that Fernandes talks about this in a different way when he talks about implants, that there's an unprocessable piece inside. And we know certainly processable or spoken about will be transmitted. So when I, you know, this brings me back to the beginning, when I said at the beginning, I wasn't sure I had the words to say it, to engage in this conversation. That brings up Marie Cardinal's book, and Marie Cardinal titled her book, The Words to Say, because her journey into a psychoanalysis was indeed a capacity to find a way to unblock some of those significations and find a way to begin the working through process. The, the paper that I finished in Cultural Ruptures is about extending that idea beyond the individual to the societal level and thinking about how we as societies can also experience as blockages and ruptures. And in fact, if you look at uh, the former Yugoslavia under Slavodan Milosevic, or some malignant leaders have a profound understanding of this at some gut level. So they know how to touch into things like, for instance, in the United States, the idea of white supremacy and in, in the former Yugoslavia, the notion, and I think Vamik Volkan talks about this, the notion that the humiliation of the service of the Battle of 1390 could be made well by having another war 600 years later. And that's really an astonishing insight, except it's used for malignant purposes, because they're using it to stir up that unconscious, not to unblock it and process it, but to allow people to re-experience it in a way that they can go out and act on it all over again. And that's what I find most frightening about, for instance, the growth of populism around the world and Certainly the trend in the United States with Donald Trump is precisely his capacity at some instinctive level. I wouldn't call him a learned man, but at some instinctive level, he has a malignant understanding. And if, in fact, if you go back to Eric Fromm's book, the, the Heart of Man, he talks about malignant narcissism in ways that really explains how somebody can have this. Perhaps people like Mussolini would have that as well, and possibly Hitler as well. But it's a rather frightening thought, and I think that what they're doing is they're showing a capacity to recognize the implanted piece, to recognize the in incorporated piece that hasn't been processed, and to poke at it in a way that it, 600 people streaming through uh, Portland, Oregon, and vehicles with rifles, and suddenly there is a frightening reenactment. Or you look at the siege of Sarajevo, which was a modern cosmopolitan city, and suddenly appear to be the War of 1390 all over again. Really, I think, quite, quite remarkable. What I thought to do then was to share a second autobiographical interlude. It also comes from that same book. And this one is going to help frame for me the notion of whiteness and, co and colonized subjectivity. Growing up in Ireland, experiences of mimicry, and when I use mimicry here, I'm using it in the sense that Homi Baba talks about. Maybe I'll pause before I do this and give you a brief example of mimicry. When I was brought up, Irish people were brought up to be inherently, especially working class, inherently inferior. We were taught English, but we were never taught the King's English. So we couldn't speak like the British or like the BBC, which was the ultimate in the King's English. And one year when I was quite a young professor, I was at a conference on a boat of all places, and I was seated for dinner next to a gentleman, and he spoke perfect Oxford British English. And I was tongue-tied for the entire night. I couldn't speak to him. And that's because I had learned English, but I, I had a mimicked version and I couldn't feel equal in any sense. And it was really a very disconcerting experience. And you know, Ashish Nandi said when he talked about um, India that, you know, the British could leave because they planted the colonizer so experience. And this complicates the issue of whiteness because when persons come from India to the United States or from Africa or any of the other colonized regions of the earth, they are seen as the other. But when people come and can pass as white, but you're also colonized. That's the position that I'm interested in exploring in this second piece. Growing up in Ireland, experiences of mimicry and otherness have always been at the core of my subject formation. Much of the psychic symptomatology of the Irish populace might be interpreted as melancholic residue from close to 1,000 years of colonization. 
My racial positioning in the US, my adopted country, is complicated by my I'm identified with the hegemonic whiteness. Noel Ignatiev, exploring the discursive positioning of Irish immigrants in his book, How the Irish Became White, calls with the white Anglo establishment in the US, adopting racist tropes and an identification with white hegemony to gain a foothold on the economic ladder ahead of black maids and laborers. Frederick Douglass visited Ireland in the 1800s. I, I have here 1845, but I actually think it was 1827 now. At the, when he was 27 years old, at least, remarked that the quote, the Irish who at home readily sympathized with the oppressed everywhere are instantly taught when they step up on our soil to hate and despise the Negro. Douglas recognized how the prospect of induction into a regime of American white supremacy assuaged racial inferiority and economic desperation among new Irish immigrants. Quote, this is Douglas again, every hour sees us elbowed out of some employment to make room for some newly arrived immigrant from the Emerald Isle, special favor. Every time I read the words of Frederick Douglass, I feel shame. That shame has many roots. The racist opportunism that caused my Irish ancestors to step on African-American people to advance their own cause. The economic desperation they felt. The expulsion of unsymbolized inferiority, as Michael Ruston calls it. The unreflexive white supremacist beliefs, combination of all these factors. I feel shame too that the incredible privation induced by the brutality of British colonialism, embedded most iconically in the Cromwellian conquest and the unfathomable suffering left profound scars on the Irish psyche, yielded a heartless impulse to get ahead at the expense of oppressed others. Absent in Douglas's analysis, however, is any recognition that white supremacist attitudes may have already been embedded in the Irish psyche before a single migrant boarded a ship, for example. I know I noticed how persuasive Christian colonial discourse of racial otherness was in the Ireland of my youth. I should clarify the piece I just read is from my article that just came out in Contemporary Psychoanalysis, but the quotes I'm going to read now come from my 2009 book. And this is how the piece from my 2009 book goes. Although I was not conscious of my racial formation, I now realize that the signs of otherness were always present. In our small town, people come to county hospital as, quote, the black doctor. The Catholic Church had bettered our racial formation through ubiquitous collection boxes, soliciting pennies for black babies in Africa. There was a collection box in every classroom with a destitute black baby staring vacantly from the photograph pasted on the front. Colonialist images of African blackness as destitute, ignorant, and other were promulgated in glossy missionary magazines, such as, quote, the Far East and, quote, Africa, which we sold door to door to help Irish missionaries in quote, darkest Africa and South America. When television came to Ireland, we also received our share of images of exotic black otherness from National Geographic type documentaries. I would go to a neighbor's house on summer evenings to watch television in a country in which Catholic bishops had the power to suppress all images of sexuality. We were permitted to gaze without shame in National Geographic specials. As Franz Fanon remarks in his analysis of the effects of colonialism on the black psyche, Quote, in Europe, that is to say, in every civilized and civilizing country, the Negro is the symbol of sin. The Negro represents the archetype of the lowest values. And then in my 2020 paper, I, I make the following remark. In this same discussion, I won't wrestled with the pervasive discourse of otherness in the Ireland of my youth, including sadly my own father's racist stance, and with how these unexamined figures of otherness had located themselves in my psyche. And this is a quote from 2009. When my mom was in New York, my sister and her newly adopted child from India, my sister lives in Ireland, that sister, we were discussing how well my sister was prepared for raising an ethnically Indian child in Ireland. My mother acknowledged that her child, her child would have problems of racial harassment involving a family of Indian origin. Then to my surprise, she said, it's just as well you're tuned on, the baby's too dark. Dad would never accept him. He was always dead set against blacks. My father had only a fourth grade formal education. He had limited access, rarely traveled beyond 40 miles radius of our family home. Living in a racially homogeneous society, what could be the source of his hatred of blacks? Did his father before him hate blacks too? Did his neighbors and friends? 
What effect did this unacknowledged hatred have on my racial formation? Are such sentiments handed from down unconsciously from one generation to the next through the inferiorization of the psyche and the transmission of historical memory? And what does knowing this do to me? Now, right here, aware of my ongoing preoccupation with residues, melancholic traces, and how the intergenerational transmission of these ancestral lineages, wounds, and otherings complicate the resolution of the context as pluralism, tolerance, or, quote, acceptance of diversity. As the epigraph to the title of Devon and Goodyear's book, History Beyond Trauma States, where off one cannot speak, there off one cannot stay silent. In my own case, my family responded to my narration of the story about my father with fury, and I was asked if we all agreed to forget that I wrote the book, we could resume normal relations. My point, of course, had not been to show up my father's feelings, but to reckon with how, as a society, we were victims of insidious, racist, colonial tropes that That's way right. through succeeding generations in Ireland and contributed to the unexamined historical antecedents of American white supremacy. So in writing the paper, I called it Whiteness and the Psychoanalytic Imagination because it drew from, I was inspired by Toni Morrison's lovely book. She talks in very, very frank terms about the inherent racialized characteristic of American whiteness. She uses an expression which I wrote down here. I think she calls it the American white man or some expression, the American white male. And her book, her, her book is a, a deep examination of our denial, of our denial of our complicity, so destructive, and that's invoked, for instance, by the Trump people at the moment. And the one that, if Black Lives Matter mean anything, the one they're really trying to interrogate. Blackness is only there as a negative of the white. Ranjana Khanna talks in one of her books about you can't have a subjectivity without a concealed and an unconcealed part. It's what we call subjectivity. If you take a unreflective white psychoanalyst talking about subjectivity and the concealed part, it's in verse, the part we dare not look at. So Toni Morrison's, uh, Toni Morrison's book was very, oh yeah, she called it the American as a new white man, the universal idea of whiteness. And one of the great tragedies for Irish people is indeed the ready assimilation into that universalism that makes Eng and, and Eng and Han wrote a book, a, pa a paper they've since written a book on racial melancholia among Asian Americans, which is a profoundly sad and moving piece of work where they speak about the impossibility of assimilation for persons who are other, because in their case, they're recognized as other. And they speak of a, an unexamined, really a sort of a unsymbolizable piece of melancholy that exists within as a result of this racial otherness. Because they sort of see the racial position of Asian Americans as melancholic and they see whites. I think the white position is much more compromised and complex than that. And I would characterize it more if you wanted to use Kleinian terms as a paranoid schizoid identification because it's built around severe paranoia. So for instance, people like me who come to and immediately, my students, my colleagues, you, perhaps anybody who meets me, positions me as a white American, perhaps as an ugly white American or a tolerant white American, but as a white American. And that, that's a very complex positionality that could easily cause me to flee to a paranoid schizoid position because of my inability to manage the difficulty, to manage the shame, to manage that my own position is one of owning Irish white supremacy and all, all, at the same time own, owning the inferiority that comes from having been colonized by the British and developing a profoundly, profoundly colonized mentality at the same time. It's a very complex position to be in. Claudia Tate, who wrote a fabulous paper uh, in Culture and Society called Freud and His Negro, has this beautiful analysis of the inherent racism, used the term Negro, to try and finesse his own ambivalence about his Jewish identity and to make jokes that would clearly position him and his patient both as white, and that he's joining himself with a white person, and they're becoming racially bonded, to use Bill Hooks's term, around the whiteness. And so um, when we look at psychoanalysis, then we have to look at the incredible lack of honesty in psychoanalysis. I trained as a, clinical, I, I trained as a psychologist, not a clinical psychologist, but a psychologist, and then I trained as a psychoanalyst, and nowhere in any of my training 
if you in the didactics, if you leave out aside my analysis and possibly a very small smidgen of supervision, nowhere was there an autobiography experience to understand the construction of my whiteness, nor to understand and interrogate the construction of psychoanalysis as a racialized entity. And that's that denial. That, the, the way that denial is addressed by, for instance, APA, the American Psychological, is through in a course in diversity, a sporadic address to, a sporadic, it's an external thing that can be cured through information, rather than seeing it as fundamentally at the heart uh, of things. Now, uh, Derry there, for instance, Jacques Derry Day, 1980-something, I forget the exact date. Psychoanalysis has traveled to all parts of the world, but it's never taken off its European shoes. And that, I think, is a thing. There's tremendous denial in our culture, in, in the psychoanalysis, notable exceptions, and I cite some of those exceptions in my paper. But in the main, if you're talking about the mainstream, the training institutes, the curricula, the supervision that's provided, psychoanalysis program, and everybody makes gestures, and everybody nods to diversity. But if you, if you explain to them the work that's required to do, for instance, about the Black Lives Matter agenda, ought to incorporate and which our students at my institution are now upending of a didactic imparted curriculum to be replaced by an introspective post-colonial curriculum and that's i suspect a bridge too far for sight uh, annie lee jones for instance and janice gump and others have done trojan work in this area pointing out the inability of us in psychoanalysis to own the wounds of slavery in the united states and Rajana Khanna talks about the inherent colonization of our subjectivities. It's not that psychoanalysis is a part of the colonial process. So a reconstituted psychoanalysis could not bear resemblance to the one we have. Now, you talk, and Tuck and Yang say that decolonization is not possible. They say that you can't, you know, it's the old thing with Audre Lorde, can the master's tools dismantle the master's house? And Token Yang would say that's impossible because no matter how well-intentioned I am, or you may be, or, or Engen Han may be, or anybody else, that if we're using the master's tools, we're still perpetuating a colonizing and racist. Race. Others, such as Claudia Tate, opened the door and has a sort of an optimism, and she's an African-American, she expresses an optimism that it may be possible that since, and this, I, I have a degree of optimism about this as well, that if you strip away and look at the core of psychoanalysis, that it's such a powerful tool for our capacity to do work, that it does have emancipatory potential. So that I think is where the debate needs to go in terms of what psychoanalysis can do. Can we, Claudia Tate says, for instance, psychoanalysis is the writing of the white Western psyche. That's almost identical to what Toni Morrison says about American literature. It's a writing of a white psyche. Deconstructed. Now, you could certainly look at Homi Baba and Stuart Hall and Gayatri Spivak and say, well, these people look like they know something the rest of us don't know because they've been doing post-colonial work for many years. And it looks like they've developed useful tools. But the work of the American psychoanalytic, the mainstream psychoanalytic journals, the one huge exception here, of course, would be Lacanian work, which clearly has made a lot of strides in this area. But outside of that, and Lacanian work has made very little inroads in, in American psychoanalysis or American clinical psychology, for that matter. So it's tricky. So in other in psychology or an adjustment psychoanalysis, which is what we have, well-intentioned people helping well-intentioned troubled people adjust and do better with the world as it is without in any way having a transformative capacity to interrogate experience and do something differently. Now, Ranjana Khanna, whose work has been very influential for me, does believe that if you take work, psychoanalyze the fundamental trauma and to psychoanalyze the melancholy, and through that to develop a way of understanding the experience of this block in signification that allows us to be unable to work with our experience. To, to, to not stay in a melancholic space or a paranoid schizoid space or a dissociated space. Abraham and Torok, for instance, says that all psychoanalysis should be a psychoanalysis in absentia of several generations. And Devon and Goodyear talk clearly about the flow of history through with that, except in my own imagination, because I haven't met anyone who's 
interested in moving out of the interest psyche into a socio-historical critical way of working. Now, I think we do have it, yes, we do have it in the academic field, but I'm talking about the clinical field, please. No, I'm just saying I'm interested in that. <laughs> Absolutely, I think transgenerational trauma is very, very real and that yeah. we need to get more in touch with our rootedness and our history because I think that's the root of all these issues is that especially specifically in America that the history has not been dealt with it's just been suppressed constantly and no. denied and now it's just bursting up to the surface to be dealt with yeah that's so that, that I think is where the work meets my paper and others like it there's some excellent work coming out stimulated I think by the upsurge of, of racial white supremacy in the United States and the Black Lives Matter movement, there's been a lot of new work coming out that's very encouraging. But I, I think that that's, that raises critical socio-historical and in some sense honest. The other paper I just finished writing is a paper in bioethics. And since we met in, in Stockholm last year, you'll recall, that's what I was talking about. I just wrote a, a paper, a published a paper in bioethics, and I thought I'd show how that thinking about psychiatry ties in with this. In fact, you know a little of my history because you just heard me recite a small, a small, highly selective smidgen of it right here. Uh, I've always been profoundly um, engaged with uh, my own experience growing up. I saw my parents experience marginalization. My sisters went along with it. My brother and I grew angry. He grew angry in an unhelpful way and dropped out of school. I grew angry in a different way and continued on in school to determine to try and find somewhere that I could rest and eventually one time later I, I think I did. But uh, there are many groups in society, I write about children for instance, I write about migrants as some of my new work, but I also write about psychiatric survivors, people who've suffered at the hands of the psychiatric system. And the framework I use for that ties in I think with this thinking. Uh, there are groups in all societies that are vulnerable groups, subject to extreme social marginalization, and short of refugees and people who are incarcerated, who are probably the most marginal groups. The next one, I would say, if you wanted to create a sort of a hierarchy, names like mental illness and so on. Mental illness implies disease. I'm more interested in dis-ease, the dash in between, because what I see in persons who struggle like this is an attempt to try and figure out their location in the world. CBT, the Cognitive Behavioral Tsunami, where he describes in absolutely frightening detail the collusion between economics and your delivery. That's absolutely commodified, oppressive, money-making and marginalizing. And what's absolutely, the, the economist was, was layered and the CBT guy in England was Clark, Laird and Clark developed this, that British National Health System bought it with line and sinker. And according to Dalal, whose view I happen to share, developed a pseudoscience based upon what they call evidence-based practices, which they define, the only evidence is the evidence they define as evidence. And all of what we do, anything clinical or anything theoretical is negated. Just as uh, President Trump succeeds with what are called alternative facts, <laughs> This is another version of the same thing where somebody, I think the greatest danger to us as academics is that the legitimacy of what we, of inquiry is under great threat. You saw what happened to George Soros' Central European University, which was driven out of Budapest and has now moved to beyond pipe bomb attacks on feminist conferences and an attempt to remove feminism from university curricula. They're really very dangerous movements and for how Delon's book clearly marks out the dangerous to all of us as academics and intellectuals when people like a know-nothing view can define themselves as knowledgeable and can define our knowledge as just another knowledge. They've, they've, taken, they've taken the relativism that we used to value so much in postmodernism and turned it into a really dangerous tool to, provo to provoke a sort of a nihilistic authoritarianism, if you like, or to be more precise, a capitalistic neoliberal authoritarianism that serves the needs of a very, very, of an elite. So, so when you come to mental health care, then one of the issues that we really have to worry about is the hegemony of neoliberal health care. And one of the books that has struck me particularly well is a book by Jean Beale, who is an anthropologist at Princeton. He's a community of psychiatric patients in Brazil who 
give up on the system and created a little town for themselves on a garbage dump. I mean, literally lived in the dump. And he went there and they were exceedingly, I mean, absolutely marginalized by society. His book is a very powerful and scathing indictment of, of what Joachim Ben calls states of exception, places where people can be defined as non-people. I always say that Hitler didn't have much trouble executing the Jews once he had managed to establish that they were non-people. The rest of the Jews, same with mental health survivors, and it can sometimes the same with children. If you could define them as non-persons, then there's no such thing as abuse because they no longer are in the category of humans. We see this in refugee camps where NGOs, governments conspire to create generations, as we know, in Kenya and Palestine and places like that. So for psychiatric sufferers, then, Beale says they enter, enter what he calls a zone of social abandonment, a space in which they no longer can experience anything. Nancy, Stof Nancy Shepard Hughes talks about vermin children in her studies in Brazil. Others use expressions like disposable lives. I think that's one from Ranjana Kana, throwaway people, and so on. And all of these capture this idea, which you get in Fasten and Reckman's book, your life, a life of no existence. And then we create that as, as we call that recovery and health. So uh, Beale, for instance, talks about the pharmaceuticalization of distress, the turning of the turning of distress into disease, the turning of disease into a profit-making pharmaceutical problem or a profit-making hospital delivery problem. And he essentially says that psychosis is essentially a social cannot be understood without understanding the context. And that's, I think, where the link to the kind of psychoanalysis I'm talking about comes in. If, you're, if your psychoanalysis or your therapy is not an adjustment therapy, then we have to recognize the social psychosis, the possibility of societies, places that drive people mad, and that we don't account for that, and then we give them pharmaceutical solutions. And Nancy, Jill Stouffer talks about the notion of ethical loneliness, that institutions that ought to be there to hear fail to listen, except that her, her notion is is a delimited, I think. She talks about it in a sort of an intrapsychic way, and I'd prefer to expand it to a much broader notion of listening to a socio-historical construction of how human subjectivity is and why people are experiencing certain kinds of suffering. Um, Aaron Soros, who uh, is a professor who has gone through many psychic episodes herself, she's a colleague of mine that I know rather well, she talks about how a psychiatric episode is an attempt to communicate a location to talk from where you are. And if we're not willing to listen or to be more precise, to pay enough that people can construct spaces for listening, then that person can't explain their location. Daniel Dorman, for instance, worked with Catherine Penny for eight years. She began as what was called back then a catatonic schizophrenic. She was on the couch and all you could see was a dribble of spittle pooling on the floor. And after eight years, she became a, function, a well-functioning person, got married, became a psychiatric nurse, and lived a full and productive life. And Daniel Dorman describes, you can't do that under a neo-behavioral healthcare system, where billing is by the second. And, and actually, the paperwork is more important than the service, and where everything is about a treatment plan and not a human being. And Julia Kristeva talks about failure to mourn archaic losses. This is not so different. I think the early onset of psychosis and how people who suffer from psychosis later have some inherent difficulty in going on being in the world. Their world dissolves in some way. And I think we don't see that often because the dissolution doesn't happen until we drop away the scaffolding of childhood and adolescence and put them in the world of responsibility. Responsibility, Freud said, to love and work, to have relationships, to engage in, a capacity to make a living, to find your location. As Aaron Soros said, if you're trying to beam out that you're lost, that your lo location has dissolved, someone has to create a space where finding a location is possible. And the bioethical work that I've been doing uh, is, is about trying to reconfigure, and this applies not only to mental health care, but to indeed all of health care, trying to find a way that we can reconceptualize the delivery of healthcare in ways that privileges narrative and context. Attack when he was, I think, 38, and cancer when he was 39, almost died twice in two years. He wrote the, a book, The Vulnerable Observer, where he talked about how his entire hospital experience was an experience of alienation from his own experience. 
and he's worked ever since to try and become a specialist in doctor-patient communication to teach attuned listening to doctors. The tragedy for us is we are attuned listeners. We've spent years training in our capacity to be interested in the superstructure of ancestry, history, politics, and, and the construction of subjective, even the nervous ones are attuned listeners. But no one will pay for attuned listening because they want to turn people into commodities who can be commodified and monetized and disposed of rapidly. And of course, ultimately, a, a sort of a space of conformity so that they will fit into the system as it is. And as you would know, the whole point of emancipatory work would be to cause people to examine their location, gender-wise, class-wise, race-wise, politics-wise, etc., and try to find ways that they can be agentic in the world. Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Professor Michael O'Loughlin. For more, please visit his website, michaeloloughlinphd.com. Rendering Unconscious is also a book, Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. From Chapart Books, 2019. For more, please visit our publisher's website, trapart.net. That's T R A P A R T dot net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, P A T R E O N dot com forward slash V A N E S S A two. 3. C-A-R-L. Your support is greatly appreciated. For more information, you can also visit my website, drvanessasinclair.net, or the podcast main website, renderingunconscious.org. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. Together, they mark a deep, be called human beings, cowering in their sty, oh, and in part a great satisfaction supersedes the trembling, be timeless, the content, jagged sword, Betty, same, by, that's a great comfort, waste, just follow the road to, of the cornucopian, Inevitable Ebby entering the third position.
injections into my head and and amused as is Florida, making out on the street, willingly bewitched. Tangibility, it's a real quest. Glassy-eyed passers-by, we get rid of the dreaded, worship the full moon, to let nods like dashboard and sublingual the end. Eating food at 1770, soap bubbles and the cakes at Devil's Alley, ourselves and hope for the best, is closed but the bar, together, when be an illness cognizable. So many the human strategies, only those who, there's eek free, can deserve to. If we pin, don't be afraid of majestic called the stench of life. It always integration of residual potential. The exotic state when words are no longer itself pathological. Normalization, polyperverse. Bilateral flare of increasingly limited ways. You thrusting and trusting. Indulgence in red lit feeling female crevices. This is New York.